Thank you very much, Maya. I, I've skipped the first slide and the acknowledgements to all my colleagues, but you're seeing a, a montage of different types of childhood dystonia. Here on the corner is Amy Bell when she was four years old, uh, presenting to me uh, in January 2001. And you can see the arm postures, which weren't unilateral then. Uh, they were actually, in fact, bilateral. Um, and, um, but the symptoms have fluctuated uh, throughout the life, uh, the early life of the child. But uh, you see here um, an artist's palette of different types of dystonia, a DYT6, which we only discovered last year, but uh, did the deep brain stimulation in 2007, a DYT1 dystonia, two, ch two twins with cerebral palsy, uh, a PANC2 disease in the uh, arched uh, status dystonicus posture, an unsolved mystery in the top left-hand corner, which I may have time to show you about, and then a classical cerebral palsy due to connectorus, which is uh, jaundice in the perinatal period. So he uh, has, has deafness, a high tone deafness, uh, and needs hearing aids, and has a typical cerebral palsy pattern, which also responded to deep brain stimulation. So not all these videos are going to work, but just to warn you. <coughs> so this is the outcome of the first child who perhaps was thought to be too serious to benefit from, from DBS. And, and, and even on this system, the video is not working, so I'm not going to try and play them. But basically, by the age of 17, he was doing a photo shot, and then he disappeared into art college, uh, and I haven't seen him since, which I, I consider to be a complete success. Um, this is a child who uh, became dystonic um, at the age of six, and she'd had her dystonia for 11 months, and we decided to push ahead uh, and do the DBS one month after seeing her. And this is really to show you the evolution of how neuromodulation can modify a dystonia, but over time, it's not an instantaneous process. Um, and it more or less takes about uh, a year for year uh, to wash out the dystonia. So if you've had dystonia for a year, it takes a year to wash it out. If you've had it for two years, it takes three years, two years, and then three years, three years. Um, I'll tell you something about DYT1 and uh, dystonia a little bit later, because it's a, it's a relatively late onset dystonia for children, even though it definitely occurs in childhood. And um, this is a boy uh, on the far side who had DBS, and I'm not sure that it's all going to work, yeah. Um, <coughs> Uh, he had no cerebellum and he was deaf. And the purpose of his DBS was so that his head could be held still so that he could have cochlear implantation. Nevertheless, as a result of the DBS, he developed what I call touchpad hand. So he was able to access screen media. Um, and his DBS worked very well for four years until there was a, an erosion of his battery with infection and it had to be removed. And then he developed status dystonicus. So he's definitely responsive to the neuromodulation. Uh, and when the neuromodulation ceased, his symptoms returned. So I'm going to try and convince you that dystonia is a developmental disorder in which timing and time and sensory motor experiences are variables influencing complex um, brain networks. And we've been talking about the fi final common pathway. And one of the issues is that all of our children have different types of dystonia, different conditions, and yet, what we have to try and find are the common elements that can be managed and harnessed and, you know, uh, satisfactorily. And uh, the issue of the passage of time and the natural history that time exerts on the disorder is something which we are not managing well uh, as a healthcare system. So this is the types of scope that we have in relation to uh, the problem, which is that we have a, a brain which is developing, an onset of a pathological process called dystonia, and then we have limited means by which we can change it. Neurosurgery through deep brain stimulation is one of the most effective, but it's not effective in everyone. Um, and um, I'm going to try and persuade you that uh, there are some ideas about dystonia which we need to embrace that might help to advance the field. So the first thing that I want to say about dystonia is that it's not rare and it's not an alien condition that visits 
unfortunate, susceptible individuals because essentially we've all been dystonic. We all have a dystonic history in our motor development. And that's why when you scratch the surface of the brain, by which I mean if you irritate the nervous system in any way, one of the things that comes out easily is dystonia. Blepharospasm, vocal dystonia, focal dystonia, generalized dystonia, metabolic dystonia, birth asphyxia dystonia, genetic dystonia. All of these dystonias come out so easily because the brain is conditioned to be hyperkinetic uh, at birth and through early life. And normally, the developmental process corrals the, dystoni the dystonic postures and then allows us to have focused, targeted, skilled action. Now, here in black is a five-year-old who has cerebral palsy, and his postures and movements are almost identical to the newborn. And what has happened is that the passage of time and motor development has not produced a, an inhibition of the overactivity, uh, and so he, he persists in his hyperkinetic motor patterns. So the question is, how do we switch on the developmental processes that suppress dystonia and favor function? Um, and how do we use an understanding of brain development for all the pathological processes that affect us later on in life? So I suspect these are not going to work either. Oh, yes. So here's a six-month-old child um, who is exhibiting classic postures of uh, moving the legs in a purposeless manner. And here's a seven-year-old who is uh, uh, trying to do a writing task, but the legs want to do ballet. And what we're seeing here, I would say, is a throwback to a period in her life when she would have done those purposeless activities because at that time, the legs and the arms were in a democratic motor state of function. As soon as the legs are purpose for locomotion, they stop doing this stuff, unless you're a dancer. Um, and so um, the fact that in her situation, this pattern of dystonia has emerged is because in her history, she has done these leg movements. So um, I hope it's some sort of comfort for everybody with dystonia to realize that the whole of humanity has been dystonic at some stage in their life. And that actually means that it's a universal condition, not a very rare condition. Now I'm going to go back in history and go back to William Gowers in 1886. And he described the leg scissoring posture, um, which he thought was due to a spinal cord injury. And um, the issue is that um, this posture has been considered to be a hallmark of spasticity. Um, but actually, everything about it is not spastic, but actually dystonic. So you'll notice that um, there's a spontaneous extensor toe, um, that there is a fisting of one hand, but on the other side, you've got athetoid fingers. And William Gowers specifically describes choreathetoid movements and when it affects both sides, double athetosis. And yet the only word which medical history seems to have lifted from this description is spasticity. And um, if you think about what is it that conditions the postures of scissoring, uh, I'm hoping this little video, which is quite ancient, is going to demonstrate. So here the child has been turned upside down and the crossing of the legs has ceased. In fact, they're now flexed at the hips and the knees, and they are parallel. Whereas when the head is held upside uh, in the upright position, there is forceful scissoring of the legs, and these legs are difficult to separate. So the operational definition of the scissoring posture that is actually the position of the head in space. It has nothing to do with a velocity-dependent stretch reflex. Uh, and therefore, it has nothing to do with spasticity. It has everything to do with a lack of basal ganglia control of the labyrinthine uh, circuits. If, if we accepted that, that's probably not going to work. Uh, this is when the child is asleep. And the scissoring of the legs is completely abolished by sleeping. 
and the electromyography that you record from the surface electrodes completely disappears. So there are all the operational definitions of the dystonic phenomenon. And if we were to include the scissoring posture um, with qualification as part of a dystonic phenotype in cerebral palsy, then the proportion of children with cerebral palsy who have dystonia would increase significantly to more than 50% of children with cerebral palsy. And the problem about not having the correct descriptions is that clinical and medical education has forgotten that clinical signs are important and that operational definitions of how you elicit those signs are important. And we've become blinded by molecular biology and we're not thinking about the actual definitions of the things that we're seeing. So dystonia is commoner in cerebral palsy than it's uh, considered to be and dystonia is a universal hyperkinetic method by which the brain begins to explore the world of movement and then works out an efficient way of producing function. If you were akinetic at birth, you would have a horrible future. You must be hyperkinetic first and then gradually get your controlled movements. Okay, and now I'm frozen. That's it in a nutshell. Now, when we're thinking about childhood dystonias, using the Albanese classification, you'll find that the majority of children that we deal with in our practice have early onset dystonia in infancy, in the first two years of life. A small group have onset between three years and 12 years, and a tiny, majority, tiny group have a, an onset after the age of 13. So as pediatricians interested in movement disorder, we must concentrate on the management of movement disorders in early life. Not, uh, as, not as late as possible, please, doctor. Um, and you'll see that most of the causes are considered to be acquired, although even acquired disorders have genetic susceptibility. So we can stretch the genetic argument to say that we are susceptible to certain injuries and therefore it's a genetic disorder. Uh, but nevertheless, in, in traditional uh, parlance, the, most of them are acquired disorders. When we have genetic um, conditions, the, the list is increasing, and DYT1 is not the most frequent. That's in pink. Uh, we have DYT11, which is myoclonus dystonia, in light green. Then we have a new kid on the block called KMT2B, which is red, 99%. PANC2 disease occupies quite a lot of our practice because we do neuromodulation. And in blue at 4%, we have the GNAO1 mutations, which cause a horrible uh, dystonic choreothetosis, which usually means that we uh, recover these patients from intensive care and do the deep brain stimulation directly from the intensive care. And I have one at home that's waiting in our intensive care just now. Um, the acquired dystonias are dominated in blue by prematurity in brown by term born causes of dystonia, and then in the light green is the conicterus, which is the jaundice, which I talk, talk to you about, and then after that, diminishing numbers of causes. So prematurity and term causes of dystonia are very important. Um, we've called the red section secondary dystonia, which is a, a verboten term, but means all the acquired causes secondary to different, different types of conditions. Um, and you'll see that among the genetic and idiopathic causes of dystonia, you have lots of dystonia with something else, with myclonus, with choreothetosis, and so forth. Dystonia with developmental delay in, in pediatrics. And the ranges of timings of onset are quite broad for a lot of conditions. But let me show you this, which is that if you look at the peak timing of onset, you'll see that the DYT1s up here are occurring relatively late in childhood, whereas DYT11 um, and KMT2B and PCAN are occurring within the first three years of life a lot of the time. And this timing of the onset at a time when the brain is less mature, has achieved less or achieved nothing at all, is what determines the fate of the children. Um, this is for the acquired dystonias, and again, 
you'll see that the acquired dystonias are occurring very much within the first two or three years of life. You have trauma, which is that soft curve with the purple spots, which can occur at any time. So for these types of dystonias, we have to have strategies which are delivered as early as possible so that brain development can continue. Now, this is a sort of cartoon model of, of akinesia, which is the green dot is the selective control, the red surround is the surround inhibition. And if you have too much surround inhibition, you can't move, that's akinesia, that's very bad for development. If you have just the right amount of surround inhibition and selective control, that is good for development. And then, of course, if you have excessive um, uh, co-contraction, and that means lo too little surround inhibition, then you have poor selective control. So um, one of the things that we see in children is that they start off having difficulties executing fine motor tasks, so everything is rather coarse. They're very keen, but it's very coarse. And gradually over time, they hone down the skill uh, to perform the task better. Um, and of course, there are other characteristics of the body that support this rather coarse and loose uh, action. One is that the, we're hypermobile when we're young, and then we get stiffer as we're older, and stiffness is useful from a motor capacity. Also, the twitch muscle characteristics are slow, so we can't, we can't perform rapid actions because of the slow muscle actions, and that all sharpens up as we get through the first decade of life. So there are lots of things that support the co-contraction. But then having achieved our wonderful skills relatively early in life, the next thing is, of course, is that we can become dystonic again, and then we have to reverse that with uh, neuromodulation or any other successful techniques which we'll develop in the next 25 years. So this is a model of how we are dystonic and we co-contract in early life, how we then develop selective motor control in the prime of our childhood, and how we can become dystonic again through pathological influences. And this is my idea of what happens when we get older, which is that we then gradually lose the skills which we've honed down in the prime of our life, and then we become we develop a more co-contracting uh, uh, style of action, which then leads to poorer, poorer function. So to me, the developmental model holds through for every stage of life. Now, neuroplasticity can be developmental, adaptive, reactive, and dystonia and epilepsy are considered to be excessive or destabilizing forms of neuroplasticity. And, and we can see why, because dystonia definitely destabilizes our equilibrium. There are all these structures which are informing the motor and sensory um, system and which can be impaired in dystonia. It's not just basal ganglia damage that causes a movement disorder. White matter damage can cause a movement disorder. Cortical damage, cerebellar damage, thalamic damage can cause a movement disorder. And of course, we've heard about neuromodulation. We would like to say that there's behavioral neuromodulation, that there's pharmacological neuromodulation, that we, do, we could use magnetic fields, where maybe wearing a magnetic field skull cap of some sort, and then the cell base, the holy grail, the, the stem cell transfer, transplantation. But at the moment, the only successful neuromodulation is really DBS. And this is the difficulty that we face, that everything has a critical and sensitive period. Uh, and there are periods when, for aspects of development, when the critical and sensitive periods are not open, so that you can't get development until they do open, then they're open, and then they shut. And then in, along comes a pathological disease and shifts the agenda and the question is, can we get our neuromodulation or whatever other modulation to influence the motor patterns before the critical and sensitive windows for functional motor skills are closed? And this then comes back to the very early onset disorders of childhood that by the time where we're seeing them at the age of five or six, these critical windows are already shutting. So 
uh, I'm going to skip this one because in the interest of time. When we look at the motor severity, and we'll just take mobility, where level one means you're athletic, level five you have no mobility, level two means you need to hold onto the handrail to go up the stairs, level three means you can walk outdoor with a walker, and level four means you can only walk indoors for short distances with a walker. You'll see that level five severity coincides with very early onset. And the other levels of lesser degree of motor difficulty occur at a later age. So now we have the most severe cases are being affected at the earliest age, which means that uh, it's very, very difficult to, for them to, uh, to recover or to improve with almost any intervention, unless it's for symptomatic relief, such as washing, dressing, sitting tolerance, sleeping at night, which is not negligible because with all of those things that don't give motor function, they give activity and participation to those children, which means they can go to school, they can eventually go to college, and they can sometimes hold down a job, provided they can access alternative communication. But they won't do that if they have a terrible dystonia that makes their sitting impossible. So now we're talking about deformity, and here in this graph we have no deformity when you're born, but gradually, if you have a movement disorder early on in life, the deformity sets in. Now, red is the cerebral palsy child, green is the child with heritage degenerative disease, gray is the child with idiopathic or genetic dystonia. And you can see who is going to get deformities earlier. And in the blue box, we've, I'm suggesting, should we offer our neuromodulation treatment between the ages of 5 and 10? or perhaps between the ages of 10 and 15 years, or maybe 15 to 20 years when the children can make up their own mind? Or should we be offering the neuromodulation before the onset of the deformity? And if that's the case, then we have to offer the neuromodulation very early on in life. And that poses all sorts of technical issues, and some people would say ethical issues, because um, this is a shot in the dark. Um, this is a scheme that illustrates what we were discussing yesterday, which is medical awareness of what something actually is, because the diagnosis, the semiology of the motor difficulty, determines what the bronze treatment or management options, as I would say, because they don't take the condition the way they make them more bearable. And um, if you offer somebody with dystonia selective dorsal rhizotomy, which is a, 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 a severing of the nerve roots, then you may make their dystonia worse. And indeed, there has been a study from Holland that says that uh, uh, there's a 20% increase in dystonia in the children who've undergone selective dorsal rhizotomy. In other words, they say that dystonia emerged after SDR my thesis would be that the dystonia was probably there but unrecognized because they thought the scissoring of the legs must be a spastic phenomenon. So we need to have um, good clinical training, and I would say that this has to be taught at medical school. It's all very well the poor old GP managing hypertension in the elderly, um, but I think if the, the, the medical students are getting this, if they're told that the the, the truth is stranger than fiction. The dystonic features are what the brain can throw up. They will remember that. And then when they go out into practice, whether they're anesthetists or dermatologists or general practitioners, they will have some idea that they got this. But the medical schools are not teaching whole systems physiology uh, anymore. Okay. I don't know why this is the one that's... Uh, yeah. I can't get my mouse to work. Okay. So if you can. Yeah. Yeah, the mouse isn't working. So. so the mouse. Yeah, the mouse. Well, while we're seeing this, this is a, a strategy for making the diagnosis. And this rather tortuous um, flowchart is the succession of medications that have limited efficacy 
in, in the world of uh, childhood or, in fact, any dystonia. And right at the very end, we have two neurosurgical techniques, intrathecal baclofen for dystonia and deep brain stimulation, which are coming out repeatedly as the only ones with uh, sufficient evidence to say that this is something you should do. But the evidence is, is limited. It's class three uh, level of evidence for um, children with cerebral palsy. Um, in uh, the genetic dystonias are much stronger, probably class two, um, and based on, on, on quite good trials and meta-analyses. So the critical and sensitive windows. There is an example of neuromodulation that's been going on for more than 30 years, and that is cochlear implantation for deafness. Now, when cochlear implantation for deafness ar uh, arose in the 1980s, it was considered to be something that you would give a child who had acquired deafness, in, that, in other words, who had previously acquired speech and language, and then with the restoration of hearing, they would be able to continue speaking. But you would never give a cochlear implant to somebody who was congenitally deaf. What would be the point? They'll never learn to speak. And over the first 15 years of the cochlear implant program, there were some attempts to give cochlear implants to children who were born deaf, and there are lots of causes for that. And lo and behold, they discovered that if you give the cochlear implant under the age of one, those children not only hear at normal speaking volumes, but they actually speak themselves and they have a normal educational profile. And if you delayed the cochlear implant, they would get hearing, say after the age of five, they would get hearing but they would not develop language. And this is what we mean by applying the neuromodulation at a time when the critical and sensitive window is still open. Because if you apply it after the window is closed, you will get some effect, but you will not get the full desirable functional effect. So I'm taking heart from the fact that biologically we have done this for hearing to allow social communication language, education, and cognitive development in children. I think the brain is not so different that it uses a different plasticity method for motor function than it does for all the other functions which it does. Um, but we're a long way yet to proving that a very early intervention program can bring about benefits. Okay. Um, and so... This is the situation we're in, that we have um, conditions that start early, and at the moment, we are applying our neuromodulation too late. So from blue through to yellow and to, and to orange, um, it's already after the age of five for when we're offering our neuromodulation. And we should be thinking that we should be offering the neuromodulation under the age of five, which means that we have to persuade our neonatal colleagues who are effectively producing a, a, a group of children who have difficulties, our community pediatric colleagues, that we need to refer early and assess early and begin to think about early intervention. And then we need to uh, get a neurosurgical technique if we're thinking about deep brain stimulation that is actually uh, friendly to the very thin and fragile um, uh, skull of, for instance, a two- or, or a three-year-old. Now, this is a slightly contested idea that the proportion of your life lived with dystonia uh, influences the liability to improve from neuromodulation. And what we have here is, um, on the horizontal scale, um, uh, up to one means 100% of your life has been lived with dystonia. Um, 0.4 is 40% of your life and so forth. And the open circles are the children with genetic or idiopathic dystonia who seem to do quite well when it comes to improvements on the dystonia scales. And in black are the children with CP and early onset dystonias who seem to do badly. And I think that um, one of the reasons why the DYT1 cases do quite well almost whatever age you offer them their deep brain stimulation is because they've had a long period of good, generous, early motor development, which is money in the bank. Then as you switch off the dystonia, that 
function comes back. But the reason why the children with cerebral palsy don't do so well from a functional perspective is because they've had virtually no time of good, generous, early development. Um, because we haven't actually neuromodulated them at a time when they could begin to have some uh, early motor development. So we still have this issue of trying to do the neuromodulation in the, in the golden box, i.e. before, for instance, a child has spent more than 80% of their life with dystonia. And this is to show you how the severity of the symptoms seems to increase the longer the proportion of life lived with dystonia. And to make the contest fair about who benefits from DBS, it's not just a case of having the same amount of severity, perhaps, but you should be saying, let's do the job at a time when the children are, have the same proportion of life lived with dystonia. Now, one way you could do it is deprive children with genetic dystonias from DBS until the age 90, which would be ridiculous. And the other way to do it is to actually bring forward the timetable for the children with the acquired dystonias. Tell me when to stop, Maya. Um, now, predictive markers. We can look at brain structure, and uh, this is using tractography, and the level of integrity of the brain fibers is also measured on a scale of naught to one, because the more fiber dire directionality you have, the greater your FA value is. So the best thing to do is to have an FA value of 0.8 or 0.9. And we looked at the children who'd had DBS who had a genetic or idiopathic cause, DBS who had a, an acquired cause, and intrathecal baclofen. And here you have, on the bottom here, is the, the white matter, and this is how the fractional anisotropy of the white matter is changing at the different levels in the corticospinal tract. And what we found was that the children we had allocated for intrathecal baclofen had poorer white matter structure, and the children who had had DBS had better white matter structure. So we could say that as a selection process, we could divide up the group of ten potential candidates and say, look, I think we must offer the DBS to those children who have the great greatest connectivity because neuromodulation is a network uh, management process. And for those who have poorer cognitive connectivity, we should say it's very unlikely that DBS will help. And we've taken this much further by doing some neurophysiology. Now, a long time ago, we started doing central motor conduction times using the transcranial magnetic stimulation to say, well, at the very least, we shouldn't be offering DBS to people whose brains are not connected to their spinal cords. It doesn't take uh, a genius to realize that if you're expressing dystonia, whatever's happening with the gearboxes inside your head is coming out in the body, but otherwise you wouldn't have the dystonia. But nevertheless, only about 20% of children that we have with dystonia have got an abnormal central motor conduction time. When it comes to the reverse journey about the sensory pathways, it's a different story. So here are some sensory pathways which are normal in a child with DYT1 dystonia for the arm and the leg, uh, absent for a child with dyskinetic cerebral palsy, uh, and then in the leg in a different child. 50% of the children that we are referred with dystonia have abnormal somatosensory evoked potentials. Now, you might say, well, what does that mean? So the next slide shows you what happens in terms of benefit from deep brain stimulation according to whether you have normal central motor conduction times, your motor pathways are normal, and normal sensory pathways. And you'll see that they're all above the green line but if you have abnormality of one or other of those neurophysiological parameters, then you'll, you'll either be astride the green line or actually be below the green line. Now, these are very small numbers. So another selection method that we've been applying now for probably 18 months is only to refer into the program those children who have a combination of normal motor pathways and normal sensory pathways. 
And this takes us right back to the idea of the origin of dystonia, which is there are sensory triggers. And you can see that if the motor system has no way of understanding what the experience of motor function has been, how is it going to hone down the processes that are going to produce normal function? They can't. So now we have the issue of how do we counsel each individual child about what their prognosis is for neuromodulation because the range is, is quite wide and every family wants to be at the 75% improvement range, not at the 10% improvement range. So one hypothesis is there's something about the connectivity or the synaptic activity um, that is uh, different if you do well and different again if you don't do so well or in fact if you do very badly. And uh, one of the things that we're exploring now is to look at that connectivity through the medium of the baseline glucose metabolism in the brain which is being done by um, positron emission tomography and we've had a, a program of looking for functional dysfunction in the brains of children who are potential candidates for deep brain stimulation um, since 2005. So we have 286 children who've had PET scans um, and we're doing a, a big uh, search to see whether we can use that data to then get back to the family and say, look, in your child's case, we think you're going to be in the 20% improvement of dystonia, or in your child's case, you are likely to do very much better. So I think this um, touches on what Marie Vidaillet was saying in the non-invasive neuromodulation, is that we are attempting to personalize the story so that each child can get the very best uh, for, for themselves, but also are forewarned about what might happen. How am I doing for time? Okay, so I've, I've said that. I'm going to actually escape from this and try and go to a, another slide at the bottom just because uh, I want to show this story if I can because it illustrates early intervention. So I you do it for me. Yes. Yeah. Your fingers are better than mine at doing this. Your fingers sit better on the other area. Okay. Okay, so I'm not sure if this is going to work. So this boy became dystonic at the age of 18 months. Uh, there should be sound. I can't hear the screaming. Um, um, oh dear, the video's got epilepsy. Doesn't like this. Oh. Um, anyway, this is uh, about what can we say will happen. So when he started his journey, it's terrible, isn't it? Um, he was in level five, unable to stand or walk. He couldn't talk. He was in terrible suffering. He was on six or seven medications that were all sedative. Um, life was miserable. We could not find the diagnosis, although we thought that he maybe had been triggered by some infections. The brain scan was normal. The neurophysiology was normal uh, and so forth. And we did this out of humanitarian, uh, on humanitarian grounds, but I watched him from the age of two to the age of two and 11 months, and then we did the deep brain stimulation. And then subsequently, I, uh, I very much regretted that we hadn't done the deep brain stimulation early for reasons which <laughs> um, become apparent. Now, it's okay in retrospect to say that you did the right thing. The question we want to resolve is how can we do the right thing prospectively? Because it shouldn't always be a guess. Now, he is still walking with the frame, but one of the jittery slides was when he was cruising around the furniture, um, uh, uh, cruising around the stairs. And so um, my prediction is that this boy is eventually going to walk 
probably without the aid of a frame, at least indoors. He may still need a frame for outdoor walking. Uh, he spent more than half his life with the dystonia um, uh, before we, we gave the neuromodulation. I think we got there just in the nick of time. But it's possible that we could have missed the opportunity and his windows, his critical and sensitive windows were shut before we offered him the deep brain stimulation. So that's that, and I'm just going to go to my conclusion slides. Okay, these are all cerebral palsy. So, you spend a life in neurology, and you go to a neurology conference, and you see a poster of somebody you recognize. And this is Amy Bell. And the factors that drive you on are the terrible predic predicament of the children. Um, I no longer need to explain why it took such a long time from the diagnosis through to the neuromodulation because, as Amy Bell has ex explained, what she didn't say was that when she came onto the ward, she saw the people who looked very, very, very twisted, and she thought, well, I'm not as bad as that case. I'm not as bad as the other case. Maybe I don't deserve this. In the minds of the physicians, they also have the same issue, which is that, well, you know, we've got these terrible cases, they've got to go, and the, the, the less terrible cases, perhaps they don't really need to have the neuromodulation, so they can spill their drinks, um, they can be clumsy, you know, in public, uh, they can be awkward and spend their whole life battling against the strategies required to hand in their projects or keep a job. But actually, the truth of the matter is, is that if you have some function and you have dystonia, then the neuromodulation allows you to have even more function. If you have very little function and you have dystonia, the neuromodulation allows you to survive without pain and allows your carers to deliver the daily needs without too much effort and allows you to participate in society. So although you don't get function, you, do allow, uh, uh, you are allowed a human existence. So I would say that childhood dystonia is a developmental, well, all dystonia is a developmental problem Childhood dystonia is particularly critical because it occurs when the brain is itself trying to build itself uh, and that uh, the medical establishment needs to try and offer these uh, management strategies early so that we can alleviate uh, uh, further disability and lack of activity and participation. Thank you. Thank you.